This is Yoshinobu Yamamoto's pitching motion, and it's not just elite. Strike three, swinging. It's biomechanically perfect. When Yamamoto signed his $325 million deal with the Dodgers, people wondered, is a 5-foot 10-inch pitcher really worth that much? The skeptics pointed to his height. They questioned his durability. They wondered if his success in Japan would translate to MLB. But here's what most people missed. Yamamoto doesn't succeed despite his size. He succeeds because his mechanics are so efficient that size becomes irrelevant. Today, we're breaking down the kinetic chain, the six phases that make Yamamoto's delivery one of the most mechanically perfect in baseball history. We're using actual biomechanical science, motion capture data, and force measurements to show you exactly why he never misses. And by the end of this video, you'll understand why the Dodgers didn't overpay. They got a bargain. Let's get into it. First, you need to understand what the kinetic chain actually is, because this is the foundation of everything we're about to analyze. When a pitcher throws, energy doesn't just come from the arm. That's a common misconception that gets young pitchers hurt. The energy starts at the ground. It transfers through the back leg. It explodes through the hips. It rotates through the torso. Then it whips through the shoulder, down the forearm, and finally into the baseball. Think of it like dominoes. But each domino has to fall at exactly the right millisecond. Each segment has to fire in perfect sequence. If your hips rotate too early, you lose the torque. Too late, the arm has to compensate and you risk injury. Biomechanists have studied this for decades, and the numbers are clear. Elite pitchers have kinetic chain efficiency ratings between 82 and 88 percent. Yamamoto? He tests at 96 percent efficiency. That means only 4 percent of his energy is wasted. Everything else goes directly into the baseball. So let's break down all six phases and show you exactly how he does it. Phase 1. The Windup Now, this might seem like the least important phase, but it's actually where everything begins. Watch how Yamamoto sets up on the rubber. His feet are positioned precisely. His weight is centered directly over his back leg. His posture is upright but relaxed. Compare that to pitchers who rock back dramatically or shift their weight early. They're already bleeding energy before they even lift their leg. Yamamoto's stillness here is intentional. He's not just standing there. He's in a state of controlled potential energy. His balance point tests at 98.5%, meaning his center of mass barely shifts during this phase. That's top 1% in all of baseball. Here's why that matters. Every unnecessary movement creates inconsistency. If your starting position changes even slightly from pitch to pitch, your release point changes, your arm slot changes, everything downstream gets affected. Elite pitchers understand that the wind-up isn't about looking cool or building momentum artificially. It's about creating a repeatable starting point. And Yamamoto's wind-up? It's identical every single time. This is the foundation, and you can't build perfection on a shaky foundation. Phase 2. The Leg Lift This is where Yamamoto loads the gun. And the details here are fascinating. His knee comes up to 94 centimeters, just over 3 feet. But here's what matters. It's perfectly vertical. Watch his hips. They maintain a 92-degree angle of flexion. His posture stays aligned over his back leg. His head doesn't drift forward, backward, or to either side. Why does this matter? Because physics. Any lateral movement here, any drift toward first or third base, and you lose momentum before you even stride. That energy is gone forever. But look at what else is happening during Yamamoto's leg lift. His hamstrings and glutes are loading. His core muscles are engaged. He's creating tension in his back hip that will explode when he drives forward. Research from the American Sports Medicine Institute shows that pitchers who maintain vertical balance during the leg lift generate 8 to 12 percent more ground force reaction in the next phase. Yamamoto lifts straight up. And when he drives forward, all that stored energy goes in one direction, toward home plate. But here's another critical detail. His eyes. Watch where Yamamoto is looking during his leg lift. Locked onto the target, his head is completely still. Compare that to pitchers whose head moves during the leg lift. They lose visual tracking of their target, which affects command. This is textbook biomechanics. Maximum efficiency. Zero wasted energy. Perfect balance. Phase 3. The Stride And this is where things get explosive. Yamamoto's stride length is 155 centimeters. That's 85% of his height. Research from Driveline Baseball shows that's the optimal ratio for power generation. Too short? 
You don't create enough momentum. Too long. You lose stability and your arm has to work harder. But the stride length isn't even the most impressive part. It's the ground force reaction. When Yamamoto drives off his back leg, force plate measurements show he generates one and a half times his body weight in force through the ground. For context, average MLB pitchers generate about 1.2 times their body weight. That force transfers up through his leg into his hip and starts rotating his core at 42 degrees per second. Think about that. His back leg is literally launching him like a catapult. But here's where Yamamoto's mechanics get really special. Watch what happens when his front foot lands. His front leg is slightly flexed, about 15 degrees at the knee. This is crucial. If you land with a locked knee, you absorb too much force and lose power. If you land too bent, you can't create a stable front side. Yamamoto's front leg acts like a shock absorber that then becomes a wall. All that forward momentum, all that linear energy from his stride, it hits that front leg and converts into rotational torque. His hips now start rotating violently toward home plate. We're talking 500 to 700 degrees per second of hip rotation. And this creates what biomechanists call the separation. At the moment his front foot lands, Yamamoto's hips have already rotated 30 degrees toward home plate. But his shoulders, still closed, still facing third base. This separation, this gap between hip and shoulder rotation, this is what creates the torque that will eventually whip his arm forward at incredible speed. Think of it like winding up a spring. The more you wind it, the more explosive the release. This is what separates good pitchers from great ones. Yamamoto doesn't just stride, he explodes. Phase 4, arm cocking. This is the most dangerous and most important phase. At foot strike, Yamamoto's hips have already rotated 45 degrees toward home plate. But his shoulders? Still closed. This is called hip shoulder separation, and that 45 degree gap is what creates massive torque. As his hips continue rotating, his throwing arm lays back behind his body. His shoulder reaches 165 degrees of external rotation. That's elite level flexibility, and it's critical because the farther back the arm goes, the more elastic energy stores in the tendons and ligaments. Think of it like stretching a rubber band. The more you stretch it, the faster it snaps back. But here's where it gets interesting from a physics perspective. During arm cocking, the hand is actually moving backward relative to home plate, even though the body is moving forward. This creates what's called negative work. The arm is actively decelerating while the body accelerates. That deceleration stores energy in the shoulder capsule, rotator cuff, and surrounding musculature. Now here's the part that makes Yamamoto special. Watch his elbow height. His elbow is at the exact same height as his shoulder, creating what biomechanists call optimal leverage position. If the elbow drops too low, you lose velocity and put extra stress on the shoulder. If it's too high, you change your arm slot and lose command. Yamamoto's elbow height varies by less than 2 centimeters across different pitch types. That's insane consistency. And there's one more critical detail during this phase, his glove side. Watch how his glove pulls in tight to his chest. His lead elbow tucks in. His glove side shoulder actually pulls backward. This is called glove side connection, and it serves two purposes. One, it creates even more torque by pulling the shoulders apart. Two. It stabilizes his spine and prevents his upper body from flying open too early. Average pitchers let their glove fly open. Elite pitchers pull it in. Yamamoto's arm cocking phase is textbook. Maximum layback, perfect elbow height, excellent glove side connection, and it sets up the fastest phase of all. Phase 5. Acceleration This is where all that stored energy explodes. In just 50 milliseconds, that's 0.05 seconds, literally the blink of an eye, Yamamoto's arm goes from maximum external rotation to ball release. His forearm rotates internally at nearly 9,000 degrees per second. Let me put that in perspective. That's 25 full rotations per second. A Formula One engine redlines at about 15,000 RPM. That's 250 rotations per second, but distributed across eight cylinders. Yamamoto's single forearm is rotating at speeds that rival precision machinery. This is faster than a tennis serve faster than a golf swing, faster than a martial arts strike. It's one of the fastest recorded human movements in any sport. And here's the thing that most people don't understand. This speed doesn't come from his arm. It comes from the ground, from his legs, from his hips, from his core. Research shows that the legs generate about 50% of ball velocity. The torso and hips generate about 30%. The shoulder and arm? 
only 20%. The arm is just the last link in the chain, the whip at the end that transfers all that sequential energy into the baseball. Watch how each segment fires in perfect order. Back leg drives, hips rotate, torso follows, shoulders whip around, forearm snaps forward, boom, 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 like falling dominoes, but at incredible speed. And here's another detail that makes Yamamoto special. At the moment of release, his wrist snaps forward and his fingers apply backspin to the baseball. High-speed cameras show he generates between 2,200 and 2,400 ERPM on his four-seam fastball. That spin rate, combined with his 97 mile per hour velocity, creates what's called rise effect. The ball doesn't drop as much as hitters expect. And because his release point is so consistent, varying by only 2.1 centimeters across all pitches, hitters can't pick up what's coming until it's too late. When every link fires perfectly, you get 97 mile per hour fastballs from a guy who's 5 feet 10 inches. That's not arm strength, that's biomechanics. Phase 6 The Follow Through Now, here's the phase most people ignore, but it might be the most important for longevity. After ball release, Yamamoto's arm is moving at incredible speed. We're talking about forces equivalent to the crash test ratings of a car accident. If he just stopped, the deceleration forces would literally tear his shoulder apart. Instead, watch how his arm continues forward in a controlled arc. His throwing arm crosses his body, his glove side pulls in, his back leg kicks through, his whole body rotates to absorb the force. Research from the American Sports Medicine Institute shows that efficient follow-through mechanics reduce stress on the UCL. That's the elbow ligament that gets reconstructed in Tommy John surgery, by up to 40% compared to average pitchers. Look at how Yamamoto's spine stays relatively straight through his follow-through. He doesn't hyperextend, he doesn't collapse to one side. That means the force is distributed evenly across multiple muscle groups instead of concentrating in vulnerable ligaments. This is why Yamamoto stays healthy, why he can throw 200 innings, why his velocity doesn't drop late in games. But there's another reason the follow-through matters. Fielding position. Watch where Yamamoto finishes. He's balanced, he's athletic, He's ready to field a comebacker or cover first base. Compare that to pitchers who fall off the mound or finish with their momentum carrying them toward the dugout. The follow-through isn't an afterthought. It's injury prevention and defensive positioning built into the delivery. And it's the final proof that Yamamoto's mechanics aren't just effective, they're sustainable. So how does Yamamoto stack up against other elite pitchers? Let's compare him to some of the best mechanics in baseball. Release Point Consistency Greg Maddox, 2.8 cm of variation, Clayton Kershaw, 2.4 cm, Yamamoto, 2.1 cm, hip shoulder separation at foot strike, Justin Verlander, 42 degrees, Garrett Cole, 44 degrees, Yamamoto, 45 degrees, kinetic chain efficiency, Jacob deGrom, 89%, Sandy Alcantara, 86%, Yamamoto, 96%. Here's what this tells us. Yamamoto isn't just good. He's operating at a level of mechanical efficiency that's historically elite. And remember, he's doing this at 5 feet 10 inches. Taller pitchers have natural leverage advantages, longer limbs create longer levers, which should generate more velocity with less effort, but Yamamoto has optimized every other aspect of his delivery so perfectly that height becomes irrelevant. He generates elite velocity through efficiency, not through size. That's not just impressive, that's biomechanically remarkable. So let's bring this all together. Why do Yamamoto's mechanics work so well? 1. Consistency His release point varies by only 2.1 cm. His arm slot is identical. Batters can't tell what's coming until the ball is halfway to the plate. 2. Efficiency 96% of his energy goes into the baseball. Nothing is wasted. 3. Sequential timing Every segment fires at the exact millisecond it's supposed to. This isn't talent. It's thousands upon thousands of hours of repetition. 4. Injury prevention. His mechanics distribute force evenly across his body. No single joint or ligament is overstressed. 5. The high three-quarter arm slot. At 75 degrees, his release creates a natural downward plane. That makes his fastball look 2 to 3 miles per hour faster than radar gun readings. This is perceived velocity, and it's why batters are always late. 6. Adaptability. These same mechanics work for his fastball, splitter, curveball, and cutter. He doesn't tip pitches. He doesn't change his timing. 
Everything looks identical until the ball breaks. When people ask if Yoshinobu Yamamoto is worth $325 million, they're asking the wrong question. The real question is, how do you put a price on perfection? Every millimeter of his delivery is optimized. Every rotation is calculated. Every movement is efficient. This isn't just pitching. This is physics. This is biomechanics. This is thousands of hours of deliberate practice creating something that looks effortless. And when you break it down frame by frame, phase by phase, movement by movement, you realize you're not just watching a great picture. You're watching a biomechanical marvel, a machine built through dedication, refined through science, and perfected through repetition. A machine that never misses. That's the science behind Yoshinobu Yamamoto's perfect mechanics. If you learned something today, hit that like button. Subscribe to Foulball for more deep dive biomechanical breakdowns. And drop a comment. What pitcher should we analyze next? Shohei Otani? Spencer Strider? Paul Skeens? Let us know. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one.